American English is, without doubt, the most influential and powerful variety of English in the world today. There are many reasons for this. First, the United States is, at present, the most powerful nation on earth and such power always brings with it influence. Indeed, the distinction between a dialect and a language has frequently been made by reference to power. As has been said, a language is a dialect with an army. Second, America's political influence is extended through American popular culture, in particular through the international reach of American films, movies, of course, and music. As Carhan has pointed out, the internationally dominant position of a culture results in a forceful expansion of its language. The expansion of language contributes to the prestige of the culture behind it. Third, the international prominence of American English is closely associated with the extraordinarily quick development of communications technology. Microsoft is owned by an American, Bill Gates. This means a computer's default setting for language is American English, although of course this can be changed to suit one's own circumstances. The extraordinary flying ability of dandelion seeds is possible thanks to a form of flight that has not been seen before in nature, research has revealed. The discovery, which confirms the common plant among the natural world's best flyers, shows that movement of air around and within its parachute-shaped bundle of bristles enables seeds to travel great distances, often a kilometer or more, kept afloat entirely by wind power. Researchers from the University of Edinburgh carried out experiments to better understand why dandelion seeds fly so well, despite their parachute structure being largely made up of empty space. Their study revealed that a ring-shaped air bubble forms as air moves through the bristles, enhancing the drag that slows each seed's descent to the ground. This newly found form of air bubble, which the scientists have named the separated vortex ring, is physically detached from the bristles and is stabilized by air flowing through it. The amount of air flowing through, which is critical for keeping the bubble stable and directly above the seed in flight, is precisely controlled by the spacing of the bristles. This flight mechanism of the bristly parachute underpins the seed's steady flight. It is four times more efficient than what is possible with conventional parachute design, according to the research. Researchers suggest that the dandelion's porous parachute might inspire the development of small-scale drones. The National Oceanography Center NOC, is engaged in research into the potential risks and benefits of exploiting deep-sea mineral resources, some of which are essential for low-carbon technology, as well as using ocean robots to estimate the environmental impact of the same potential deep-sea mining activities. Late last year the NOC led an expedition on the RRS James Cook that found enough of the scarce element tellurium present in the crust of a submerged volcano that, if it were all to be used in the production of solar PV panels, could provide two-thirds of the UK's annual electricity supply. Recently, the NOC also led an international study demonstrating deep-sea nodule mining will cause long-lasting damage to deep-sea life, lasting at least for decades. 
These nodules are potato-sized rocks containing high levels of metals, including copper, manganese and nickel. They grow very slowly on the seabed, over millions of years. Although no commercial operations exist to extract these resources, many are planned. Professor Edward Hill, executive director at the NOC commented, by 2050 there will be 9 billion people on Earth and attention is increasingly turning to the ocean, particularly the deep ocean, for food, clean supplies of energy and strategic minerals. The NOC is undertaking research related to many aspects and perspectives involved in exploiting ocean resources. Ethics is a set of moral obligations that define right and wrong in our practices and decisions. Many professions have a formalized system of ethical practices that help guide professionals in the field. For example, doctors commonly take the Hippocratic Oath, which, among other things, states that doctors do no harm to their patients. Engineers follow an ethical guide that states that they hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Within these professions, as well as within science, the principles become so ingrained that practitioners rarely have to think about adhering to the ethic it's part of the way they practice. And a breach of ethics is considered very serious, punishable at least within the profession by revocation of a license, for example, and sometimes by the law as well as scientific ethics calls for honesty and integrity in all stages of scientific practice, from reporting results regardless of properly attributing collaborators. This system of ethics guides the practice of science, from data collection to publication and beyond. As in other professions, the scientific ethic is deeply integrated into the way scientists work, and they are aware that the reliability of their work and scientific knowledge in general depends upon adhering to that ethic. Many of the ethical principles in science relate to the production of unbiased scientific knowledge, Working 9 to 5 for a single employer bears little resemblance to the way a substantial share of the workforce makes a living today. Millions of people assemble various income streams and work independently, rather than in structured payroll jobs. This is hardly a new phenomenon, yet it has never been well measured in official statistics and the resulting data gaps prevent a clear view of a large share of labor market activity. To better understand the independent workforce and what motivates the people who participate in it, the McKinsey Global Institute surveyed some 8,000 respondents across Europe and the United States. We asked about their income in the past 12 months encompassing primary work, as well as any other income-generating activities, and about the professional satisfaction and aspirations for work in the future. The resulting report, Independent Work, Choice, Necessity, and the gig economy, finds that up to 162 million people in Europe and the United States or 20 to 30 percent of the working age population engage in some form of independent work. 
While demographically diverse, independent workers largely fit into four segments exhibit free agents, who actively choose independent work and derive their primary income from it, casual earners, who use independent work for supplemental income and do so by choice, reluctant, who make the primary living from independent work but would Current research into the nature of the relationship between participation in physical activity, sport and educational performance has produced mixed, inconsistent and often non-comparable results. For example, some cross-sectional studies illustrate a positive correlation between participation in sport and physical activity and academic success, e.g., maths, reading, acuity, reaction times. However, Critics point to a general failure to solve the issue of direction of cause, whether intelligence leads to success in sport, whether involvement in sport enhances academic performance, or whether a third factor, e.g. personality traits, explains both. Longitudinal studies also generally support the suggestion that academic performance is enhanced, or at least maintained, by increased habitual physical activity. Yet such studies are criticized for not being definitive because some do not use randomized allocation of pupils to experimental and control groups to control for pre-existing differences. Others tend to use subjective teacher-assigned grades to assess academic achievement rather than standardized and comparable tests. And some programmers include parallel interventions, making it difficult to isolate specific effects. A farming technique practiced for centuries by villages in West Africa, which converts nutrients-poor rainforest soil into fertile farmland, could be the answer to mitigating climate change and revolutionizing farming across Africa. A global study by researchers has for the first time identified and analyzed rich fertile soils found in Liberia and Ghana. They discovered that the ancient West African method of adding charcoal and kitchen waste to highly weathered, Nutrient-poor tropical soils can transform the land into enduringly fertile, carbon-rich black soils which the researchers dub African Dark Earths. Similar soils created by Amazonian people in pre-Columbian eras have recently been discovered in South America, but the techniques people used to create these soils are unknown. Moreover, the activities which led to the creation of these anthropogenic soils were largely disrupted after the European conquest. Encouragingly researchers in the West Africa study were able to live within communities as they created their fertile soils. This enabled them to learn the techniques used by the women from the indigenous communities who disposed of ash, bones and other organic waste to create the African dark earths.